we're now here with Iltal, and I have a bunch of interview questions. But he already introduced himself from New Jersey, just like me. I'm Zach, by the way, and we're very happy to have a cool hip hop producer here in the studio. So, how how long have you been making beats? Uh, since 1997, actually. So uh, I'm a little older than some people, probably. But uh, yeah, it's been uh, since I was 14 years old, actually. It's when I made my first beat. Sick. And you you collect a lot of records, from my understanding, right? Yeah, I started collecting before I started making beats. The first records I got were actually George Clinton's Parliament albums. And um, I started getting those because Dr. Dre was really popular at the time. He was sampling George Clinton. I wanted to hear the originals. So I started copying those in 96. And right now, the last time I counted, I have around 7,000 records. And the only reason I know how many I have is because I recently moved about a year ago and I had to move all of them. <laughs> so I was able to uh, count and see how much it was actually there. Do you have like an intricate labeling system for all your records or? They're, well, they're all sealed in a plastic flap, like they seal in the comics, like those type of bags. And I have it organized uh, by genre and for my hip hop section, it's alphabetical. Everything else is just kind of genre basically. Will you, will you always sample from the records or do you ever pull from other things? I have made a couple keyboard beats um, I have a Roland Phantom synthesizer and a Planet Fat, which is a really old one from the 90s. I do it sometimes. I like to layer a lot on top of samples. So I'll play bass lines or add like strings or piano chords underneath samples a lot of the time. But as far as straight, just synthesizer beats, I really don't do it that often, but I have. So like uh, the most... I, they are the most two recent tapes, right? With the Trapped in the 90s and Still Trapped in the 90s, right? Or Yeah, those are my only like instrumental albums. Everything else I have is either like a remix or working directly with the artist. Okay. So with the, the 90s theme, how do you, what's your, what's your idea for sticking with, you know, that sort of production style? And I mean, you know, you do it in your own way. So how, how do you explain to like a, uh, artist or do you think that this is coming back or something like that well so the way that the two albums came about was um i don't only make 90s beats i mean everything is heavily 90s influenced but i started making like a couple 90s beats and people were like oh you should just do like a whole album of that so i want to do an instrumental album but a lot of instrumental albums was boring it's 60 minutes of some guy that put a bunch of beats together with no change-ups and nothing going on so I want to do it different. That's why all the beats on the Trapped in the 90s series, they have hooks, they have scratching, they have little samples in between. So I want to make it like, so you'd actually want to listen to it. So it sounds like an album and not just some instrumental beat tape. But um, as far as the 90s sound, I mean, I was alive when it was out. So when I was a kid, that's what I listened to. That's, I learned that way to do it. And that was, you know, I decided to continue with it. Obviously, it was really hard, like, in the early 2000s. I was still making, like, these type of beats, and at that time, it was just all, like, Swiss Beats was big and everybody like that. And just nobody wanted to hear anything even remotely close to what I was making. And it wasn't until stuff like Joey Badass started coming out recently where now people are going back to that sound. So I was just taking advantage of it. Like, well, I've been doing this for a couple of years. I better uh, start putting it out again while people like it again. <laughs> yeah. You had a, you have a video about chasing Joey Badass or finding it's not him, right? chasing him, but <laughs> stalking him. <laughs> That's a couple <laughs> people said that, but I'm uh, just joking. Nah. I'll uh, I'll give you the whole story on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. So, a couple of years, I'll say like 2011, this rapper that I was working with, he was trying to tell me, oh, you should hit up this kid, Joey Badass, whatever. And I didn't want to hear it. I was just like. Uh, it's like, everybody, you always tell me to hit up sucks, and, like, I'm not even going to waste my time listening to you, whatever. So, like, a year goes by, and then I saw, like, his video, and I'm like, oh, you know, let me take a listen to their music, because I never listened to it before. So I started listening to it, and I'm like, I was like, oh, man, this kid really would sound good <laughs> on my beats. Maybe I should have listened to this guy a while ago. So I started hitting up everybody I knew, 
be like, oh, well, I know the engineer that works at Joey's Badass in the studio. All right, you know, try to give him some beats. Hit up the blocks. Oh, I, we know his manager. We can send the beats over to him. Okay, do that. Hitting up emails, Twitters, all the pro era members, just like, yo, like, you guys want beats, whatever. And, of course, nobody responds to me because now they were all, at that point, they were already, like, semi-famous. So I'm like, damn, like, I got to get in contact with this kid somehow. So I decided to do some outlandish shit. And basically, I was going to originally just put out snippets and be like, just call it Searching for Joy Badass, and that was going to be the end of it. But I'm like, nobody's going to listen to, you know, eight, ten minutes of beats and just sit there and staring at their computer. So I was like, let me do visuals with it, too so that somebody will actually listen to the whole thing. So my boy got a camera. We went to New York. We started posting up flyers everywhere in Flatbush like at like midnight on a Friday. Not the safest place for me to be, but whatever, I did it. And um, we were out there. We put out the video. A lot of people were like, oh, wow, you know, that's dope. Why didn't I think of this? Other people were like, yo, you crazy? What's wrong with you? Why are you stalking him, obviously, and this and this and that. And uh, what happened is somebody that went to high school with him saw the video and they posted it on his personal Facebook and he saw it and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's a little weird, but I'll hit him up. And he never hit me up. So I'm sure he has other things to worry about now. But if our paths cross, I'll work with him, but I'm not going to go chasing him again. Yeah. But to clear, you, we weren't like actually chasing. We just wanted to give. Nah, I wanted to originally I just wanted visuals. It wasn't meant to be serious. Like yeah. I never been to any of his shows. So it's not like, you know, I was waiting outside for his tour bus, like yeah. screaming, hey, listen to my beats. And it wasn't meant to be like, you know, super serious. Like there's a scene like where like I'm looking him up on Wikipedia. That was like <laughs> supposed to be like a joke. I wasn't yeah. like really stalking this kid. But you do you do a few. You do a lot of videos, actually. Uh, like I saw your uh, producers be like, yeah, or something like that. So I mean, like right now it's it's tough for a producer to get exposure without rappers over your beats. So in the downtime when nobody's doing a song or I don't have a project coming out, I need something. So, you know, I do that stupid comedy video producers be like, and it ended up everybody hit me up, oh my God, so funny, or, you know, you should do more like these or whatever. So every chance I get, I try to at least, you know, do some kind of video every once in a while. Do you, so do you like mixing sometimes the humor into your beats? Like I know in the tapes, there's like a little bit of, you know, there's some commentary going on. Like yeah, I'm a, I'm a jokester. You know, I, I screw around. I'm not super serious. I mean, the one picture you see of me, I have like a stone cold ice grill on my face. But I'm really like whatever. Like I like joking around. I like having fun. And that's what like when I listen to hip hop, that's what it was all about. So there's no need to be you know street thug and all hardcore all the time like you want to joke around or laugh you know do it so and that does there's i have a lot of serious beats and i have some goofy beats that you know you'd laugh if you heard them but like uh, the beat nuts i'm heavily influenced by them they're really funny dudes so yeah who else uh do you take as like influence for uh your production style and uh, the list is long but definitely say the beat miners um, RZA, early RZA, pre-Bobby Digital, um, Havoc from Mob Deep, Large Professor, Buckwild, Diamond D, Marley Mall, if I really want to go back. Um, just really all the golden era producers, P-Rock, DJ Premier, obviously, but everyone's influenced by them, whether they like it or not. <laughs> uh, back to like videos and visuals and things like that. You, you also run your own website sort of blog too, right? So. so the way that came about, originally when I started my site, it was just a strictly promotional tool just to post up new music that I was doing. And then when I didn't have any music to post, um, I'm like, well, I have all this dead space. I got to do something. No one's going to come to my website once every five months. So um, I have a basement full of records. I'm like, I need to start using these records to, you know, to get some promotion back. So I started posting up drum breaks and, you know, well-known samples and stuff like that and writing little excerpts on them because a lot of people, you go on YouTube, you look up, oh, hip-hop samples, they listen to 10 seconds of the song and that's the end of it. So what I did on my site was, um, you know, I told the story, like, who was the artist or, uh, you know, who was the producer that used the artist and, you know, any other little 
trivia information that you can add. I mean, I have all this in my head. I may as well put it out there for other people to read. So um, I try to teach other people that are looking for samples that just don't go on YouTube and, you know, that's cheap. Do it this way. <laughs> so I try to get that knowledge out there. So you, so when you're, when you sample an artist, you, you try to research a lot about who they are and things like that. So I've been doing it so long that like there's certain things you look for, like, uh, you know, that record you got on your wall right there, ECM, that record label, that's a jazz record label that has really high end recording and it sounds really clear and crispy. A lot of the records have drum breaks on them. So whenever I see an ECM record, I'll pick it up because I know that the chances are there might be a, you know, a drum break on here. Same thing if you see, uh, for example, there's this song called uh, Windmills of the Mind. It's from a soundtrack. If you see that on a record, a lot of versions of that song are really good. So I'll always buy the record hoping, well, if that song's on there, maybe something else is on there. Um, you start reading who played the instruments on the album. You see Bob James played keyboard on the album, pick it up and may have something good on it. So if, if you want to buy better records and not, you know, buy something, waste your money on a whack record, then you eventually start picking that stuff up. So what's your what's your main way of uh, picking up records now? I, we were discussing it off mic uh, you, about shows, but... Uh. So right now, um, a lot of the record shops, there used to be a lot in, in Jersey where I lived. There was... Uh, there was one in Hackensack, there was another one in Clifton, there was one in Garfield, and they all started closing. Um, so I don't really go to record stores anymore, there's not too many around my way. But once a month they have a, a record show in New Jersey that I go to with like 20 different dealers. And I go there and I buy records. Sometimes I go to the New York shows, but a lot of times they're overpriced. Um, they raise the prices in New York a little bit because people have more money here. Do you ever sell any of your records or you've kept all of them? I can't sell a record if I wanted to. <laughs> There's records I have that are I will never listen to that I don't like and for some reason I just don't have the heart to like get rid of it. I have the only records I'll get rid of is like double copies that I have. But even that I have trouble letting go. <laughs> is that your only thing that you collect or are you in the like comic books or something too the scenes? Nah, I don't I don't collect um comic books or whatever i used to collect coins when i was a kid <laughs> for, for a very brief time in my life but that was i was like 10 years old or something like that i do have a very specific um collection of 45s though that uh they don't have samples on them but they they were uh george written by george clinton before he was doing drugs and into p-funk uh, when he used to work in detroit in the mid 60s so i have like almost that full collection of 45s Almost. Yeah, there's three that I'm missing, and um, they're very rare, and they sell for like two thousand dollars each, which I don't have laying around. So <laughs> I might not get them, but maybe when I'm older, if I win the lottery. What What do you think about um, like record sales increasing, like vinyl record sales? Because I, I mean, I've, I've been seeing news things saying that it, like it's kind of on the rise a little bit. How do you feel about that? It's like a good thing and a bad thing at the same time because the whole vinyl resurgence thing first started happening like with hipsters in Brooklyn. And, you know, these dudes were buying records because they like the cover or they buy like the stupid Thor's album and the Beatles album and whatever. Whatever, that's their thing. I don't care because they're not buying my records, they're buying theirs. But after that... Then you had all these indie rock guys start putting out their albums and they had the record store day where they have all these exclusives. And it's cool, whatever, anybody that's buying vinyl is good, but I think the people that are getting into it a lot of the times now, it's more like a fad. Like, I don't think they're still going to be buying records five years from now. I had this one guy at my job that was uh, he's buying records like crazy. And I'm like, hey, like, you know, I could teach you, you know, what to buy or whatever. I have a lot of records. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like now, he's not even buying records anymore. So there's a lot of people like that. Like when I go into Urban Outfitters and I see they have a vinyl section, like I laugh. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> do you do you prefer something to be on vinyl than if it was like released on CD? Like anything new, I don't really care. Like I have, I buy stuff on iTunes and Amazon. I bought the Prime album, the Primo and uh, Royce 5.9 on vinyl because... I had like a gift card, but I don't need it to be on vinyl. If it's old 
and I want to sample it or I want to collect it, then it has to be a record. And I don't buy reissues or compilations either. I'm very... Uh, you only sample on vinyl? Yes. You? Yes. That's a, that's a note to take. I always feel like... I mean, I, I, it might be my young years, but I always feel like I could hear the... Guess distortion, the scratchiness of vinyl sometimes, but I think it's because I hear a lot of old records. I know I've heard new records, and I know that's not there. But I feel like sometimes with the older records and people don't keep them up, it's it's like a pain to try to work with it. But I mean, you could tell sometimes you could tell when somebody samples an MP3 versus vinyl. Um, a lot of people now they sample stuff off of YouTube, and you can hear like the low bit rate. You can hear like the digital distortion versus vinyl static and sometimes it'll laugh like i'll know somebody didn't sample the record and they add like fake vinyl static to it like that that's really corny to me i don't like that <laughs> so you you have a, a home studio right i guess i've seen pictures or something I mean, it's like not that. it's not state of the art you know quincy jones isn't down there but uh <laughs> i have um i have a mic the shore sh5 or whatever it's called and um I don't have a booth. I just have the mic there, but it's in a basement, so it's kind of covered up anyway. Then I have uh, a computer, an old PC, not Mac, um, with Pro Tools. Then I have a MPC 2000, um, S5000, which is a, a rack version of a Akai sampler. A lot of the old guys use the S950, if you've ever heard that. This is the more re recent version. Um, have a little MIDI controller with a little keyboard. Have the Planet Fat, the Roland Phantom, and then um, I have two turntables. They're not Tech 12s, they're actually Tech 13s, <laughs> which is an older version, um, and a mixer. And then down there is where it all happens. It's very old school in the basement hip hop setup. But you've uh, you've worked with a, a few artists, right? Uh, who have you who have you worked with? Oh. Officially, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, because I've done like a couple remixes for like contests and stuff, but uh, officially, I've worked with Craig G from the Juice Crew, um, a rapper who has since retired now, but he had quite a following at one point. His name was The Ills. I recently did a song with it's not out yet, but it's uh, with Sadat X from Brand Nubian, um, this guy from Philly. And then the uh, Phantasm from the group The Cellar Dwellers, which is another old school group. So they're all on the same song. Um, Do you ever have to go to another studio to work, or you you pretty much make it in your own and send it out? Or yeah, something? everybody's just emailing. I haven't like actually been in a studio. I don't know how long. <laughs> how How do you feel about uh like the general trend of a lot of artists going independent now, or staying independent, not really going independent, but. I mean, you kind of have to now. I mean, I don't think that the um, the major record labels are going to be around in maybe 20 years. Um, maybe they'll have like one or two artists or something like that. But the way that the music is going, especially with streaming, I don't know how they're going to be able to have a sustainable business model at this point. You know, it costs millions of dollars to make a superstar and a superstar is not going to generate millions of dollars anymore. So... I don't really know that they have a choice. You got to be independent. And I think what's going to happen because of that is um, hip hop might go back to a more regional type of thing. You know, when I was growing up, Atlanta sounded like Atlanta. New York sounded like New York. Chicago sounded like Chicago. And at one point, everything just sounded the same from everywhere because of majors being able to have the money to promote it everywhere. Independence aren't going to have that type of cash flow so we're going to be able to promote it you know in their area so that might affect the music i don't know i hope it does i think it's good to have a, a mix and a balance but we'll see do you have a current view on uh like the the general like who's winning the the rap scene right now uh, <laughs> i i'm so disappointed at music right now but um i mean i i think i haven't heard the kendrick lamar album yet I like the first song because that's George Clinton, but I didn't hear the rest. But um, I think I'm glad that he's using his star power to actually say something. Like, he's the opposite of Drake where, you know, Drake got really popular. 
but he's still making, you know, chick music. He's popular enough now where he can say, you know, I can make what I want. I could do a diss track. I could do a social commentary, but he's not. He's still making chick music. So even the underground, a lot of the underground stuff is boring right now. Like people think, you know, oh, this guy, he listens to probably all this underground stuff. And uh, like, nah, like a lot of that's whack too. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I'm just, a lot of it's watered down, but there's, there's some good stuff. This has actually been a better year, definitely than last that like, you know, I'm, I bought a couple albums this year already. So who are you listening to now? I like Bronson. I like uh, year old Droog and I like Joey Badass and Pro Era. Um, I liked Our Future. I haven't heard any of their recent stuff. I know, um, what's the one guy's name? I he think just, Earl's about to drop yeah, a yeah. tape like this next week. Yeah, I got to hear that one, see how that is. Yeah, he just put out a single. It's like real grim and scary <laughs> video. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I don't really vibe with anything on the radio right now. Trap, I, it's not my thing. <laughs> so you're going to put out a new trap instrumental mixtape or something nah. like that? <laughs> It's probably good. I think there's way more than enough. There's way more than enough. Could you tell any people where to go to like check out your music or well, you have your own website, so you should. Say. I'm all over the place online. I'm, I actually do okay at that. Um, I got my website, illtal.com. That's i l l t a l dot com. Um, I'm on Twitter, illtal beats. Instagram, same thing. Facebook. I'm Google Plus, even though I have like 60 followers on there because nobody uses it. But if that's your thing, I'm on there. Um, I got a Tumblr page. I don't like Tumblr too much. I don't understand it. <laughs> and my SoundCloud and my Audio Mac too. So it's all Ill Tower, Ill Tower Beats. Okay. Um, I think I got you through um, SoundCloud. A, a certain, well, yeah, I got you through SoundCloud, but I heard your tape through. Oh, how can I not remember? It's they they have a ton of mixtapes on DJ there. Booth. Yeah, DJ Booth. Yes, yes. I don't really hear anyone talk about DJ Booth, but they put out like a good amount of stuff. I don't exactly understand how it works because they like have all these ratings, but I'm like, who how are you rating this stuff? Yeah, D, so DJ Booth dot net and big shout out to them. Um and DJ Z over there. They're one of the only major blogs that has ever not ignored me. <laughs> um what happened, the one rapper that I mentioned before that had retired, he had a good relationship with them. So I saw the opportunity and I seized it. And I'm like, hey, I used to produce for this guy. You really liked him. How about you listen to my stuff too? So um, DJ Z over there actually really liked the Trapped in the 90s stuff. So they put it on there. Um, they get a lot of hits, a lot of impressions. So a lot of people heard my music through there. And a couple of people hit me up based off of that, asking for beats and stuff. So. I'm uh, very grateful to DJBooth.net. So you sell people beats? To yes. Okay. I'm not like a millionaire off of it. I have a regular 9 to 5 job, but uh, I make some money on the side selling beats. But if anyone wants a beat from you, they can uh, they contact you through your website? Yeah, I have like a little online store there with uh, like 30 or so snippets that you can listen to. Um, you can hit me up. Um, I have certain rules. I don't like uh, a lot of people either... If you're really whack, man, I don't, I don't want to sell you a beat. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like a waste. You know what I'm saying? You have to check them out before you sell them the beat. Yeah, like when somebody hits me up, I'm like, can you send me a link to your music? And, you know, if they're, if they're good, then, you know, I'll give them a discount. If they're really good, I'll say, here, take the beat for free. Like, you know, you're serious. If you have a big, like, online following, you know, I'll work with you because you're helping me out. But if you're MC no name and you can't flow and whatever, I'm going to be like, uh... Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, uh, one, one question I forgot to get to is like with, with sampling and things like that, uh, I mean, you seem to pay a lot of respect to the artists, but at the same time, I know there's a lot of conflicts with, uh, like licensing and things like that. So, uh, oh yeah, I got, I got a lot of stuff to say about all this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, it's the artist's responsibility when somebody rhymes over my beat. If they want to clear it or if they feel safe releasing it without clearing it, that's their responsibility. Um, they're aware there's a sample in there. <laughs> so um, I did get threatened with a lawsuit once, and it wasn't my fault. It was 
the rapper that I used to work with, um, he was selling the song, and by some fluke, some you know random act, the original artist heard it, and he threatened to sue me for like ten thousand dollars, and um, we ended up selling settling for uh, quite a bit of money, not ten thousand. Um, <laughs> it was two thousand bucks, but. Basically, me and the rapper split it because it was half his fault, too. And we had to pay this dude so he wouldn't sue us for copyright infringement. So it is serious. So make sure when you are sampling something that it's not known or you chop it up or that uh, you hide it well. <laughs> that's, your, that's your advice to anybody trying to sample and make beats out there? Yeah, I mean, it was a well-known sample, too. It wasn't like... And it, it wasn't a like a beat that I wanted to make. It was more of a request. Or like normally I would never have used that, but he wanted it, and then you know that's what happened. He won that specific song to yeah, kind yeah. of be in his own song. Yeah. So he got too popular, and people heard it. A couple people actually heard him because not from my beats, but from other beats, and they hit him up too. And like you know, they were smaller independent people, so he paid like five hundred bucks or whatever to use the sample and stuff like that. But. It does happen. You got to be careful. Anyway, you just go to whosample.com and Shazam and start finding out what you're using. So, Yeah, that makes sense. How do you feel about like flipping a sample that you know other people have have used before? Because uh, you have all the videos that are like, oh, like the Alchemist used all these samples. Like, Do you still use those samples in your own way? No, nah, like? I can't. I feel cheesy. <laughs> you can't, even if you pick like a different part of the song? Uh, sometimes, but... I'm sure there's a lot of times what'll happen is I'll sample something and I, and I didn't know somebody else used it and then somebody will tell me and then I'll be like, ah, oh, come on. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I have so many records I don't need to use other people's samples. That's my uh, thing, so. But yeah, I don't like doing that. Drums, yeah, whatever. Drums are open season. But uh, actual, like a loop, nah, I tried. Oh, to there that. was, um, you. I saw a post that you made about uh, the GoFundMe with Richard L. Spencer. Yes. For the, the Amen Brother break? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So um, I'm not involved with it, but I saw it and I thought it was cool. Uh, basically, uh, the drum break, Amen Brother, I should have brought it tonight. I didn't. Um, it's been used thousands of times, not even in, in hip hop, in drum and bass and in UK with all uh, a lot of techno stuff and all those electronic genres. And... Um, the guy I never got paid who wrote the song. So the group was called uh, the Winstons. And uh, the guy never got paid. So some dude in England, he had an interview with uh, the songwriter. He told him a story. So he felt bad and he started a, uh, a GoFundMe for this guy. And I think it's up to like $30,000 or something at this point. Um, that happens more often. Well, not the GoFundMe part, the part about not getting paid. Um, a lot of these companies, they uh, they bought the masters, and the original artist doesn't get a penny off of something. So it sucks, but it happens. It's real. It's very real. Uh, I think you you have a you have a live set planned for us to show us some breaks. Is this gonna have commentary and stuff on? Or uh, I don't know if it'll have commentary, but I will add this. Um, Everything that I will be playing, I'm going to play a, a drum break mix. So I got about 50 records or so. And um, I'm going to play a bunch of drum breaks. None of these are reissues. They're all original. None of them are bootlegs. They're all original. Um, there's no compilations. I'm not playing ultimate breaks and beats over here. I'm playing the real record. So uh, very serious about that stuff. So I just want to make sure everybody knows. But uh, yeah, we'll get into it soon. Okay. Yeah, we're going to play some beats. Uh, I mean, we're going to play some more of uh, Still Trapped in the 90s, and then uh, we'll get into his uh, set. So it's now a 2.08 on uh, March 20th. Uh, thanks for listening. This is WKCR 89.9 FM New York, WKCR HD1, WKCR.org if you're on the internet listening to us. Stay tuned. We're here with Il Tao, and uh, we're about to play some more Il Tao, and we're going to have some more Il Tao. So let's get into 